So we'll start. Okay. So the title for my talk is Laws of Robotics and Human Consciousness. So you must be wondering what is the relationship between robots and human beings, right? Artificial intelligence is here. So what is the relationship between artificial intelligence and human beings? Right. So I want to address this issue and in this talk, so I'll talk about robotics, the laws of robotics and the dilemmas that it faces. And then I'll ask the question about what are the laws of human being, human consciousness. And when we look at matter and consciousness, because so far we have had matter and consciousness which was residing human being. Now what happens as machines become intelligent? Do they become conscious or not? If they become conscious, then what are their properties? And then I'll say what are the implications for society or the kind of society we want to build? So I'll straight away jump into this. So I'll talk about three laws of robotics. And this they arose out of a concern that robots can do damage. They can harm human beings, right? You all remember that story, Frankenstein? So Frankenstein was a robot, if you like, biological robot created by a human being. And it went out of control and it went against its creator. So it went out to kill its creator, human being. Okay. So after that, all the stories that were written, this was a fiction, this was not real. But all the fiction was about what if robots turn against human beings. Now, science fiction writers felt, no, we are very limited with this theme. There is only, this is the only theme. So Isaac Asimov, famous science fiction writer, came up with three laws of robotics. And actually, he wrote the first story <coughs> with essentially these three laws in 1942, you know, 80 years back. So what is the first law? So he postulated three laws robots will have to obey. Okay? So these robots have so-called positronic, not electronic, positronic brains and they all obey these three laws. The first law is a robot will not harm a human being or allow harm to come to a human being through inaction. So robot, if he's just sitting and sees, you know, some harm coming to a human being, he'll do something. Second, a robot will obey human beings. And the third one, robot will protect its existence. Now the question is, there may be conflict between these laws. So there is a priority. So robot, the second law, a robot will obey human beings provided it does not contradict the first law. So if you order the robot to go and kill such and such person, it will refuse to obey. Why? Because it conflicts with the first law. And similarly, Robot will protect its exist, uh, itself, its existence, provided it does not conflict with second law and first law through transitivity. Okay? So these were established as the law of robotics and then lots of interesting stories were written. Uh, some of you who are interested in science fiction would have read those stories, right? Very, very interesting stories which they which arise once you say there are these three laws. So the question is, is causing pain to someone equal to causing harm? That's the first question that comes, right? So is it the same? Causing pain to someone is causing harm? To give a tough exam to students, they are all very pained. <laughs> okay? Yeah. 
No. It doesn't matter who is causing the pain. Yes. Yeah. No, no. He's causing pain. Professor is causing pain. With the injection, is he causing pain? He's certainly causing pain, but is he causing harm? No. Right? He's trying to cure the patient. Or the teacher is trying to build strength in the student for future. So pain is not equal to harm. Eh? Very opposite. Normally you say pain is equal to harm. I got harmed. Right? So, the, you, so you can see what dilemmas arise. A person is swimming in water. Now, what should the robot do who is passing by? You will not allow harm to come to a human being through inaction. And serious harm can come, he can drown. He is swimming, but what if he drowns? What about a person walking on the road? He can be hit by a vehicle. So what should a robot do? Okay. So these are the dilemmas that come between, so this is a conflict between the, the, the first law itself and uh, here there is no obey, but first law by itself also requires judgment. And here, of course, yeah, here it is uh, recognizing that there is no harm is not being done. Now the question is, what about mental harm okay. or mental pain which can potentially harm, right? So comfort versus harm. So there are stories where a robot doesn't want to cause any pain, any harm to a human being. So if something bad has happened, won't tell you. He will tell you good stories, but won't tell you, okay? And so this robot was known for lying. It would lie and lie. Why? Because it doesn't want to cause you any mental difficulty, comfort, discomfort. And what does it cause later on? Person realizes, you know, something bad has happened and is totally unprepared for it. So, if you include physical harm, mental harm, mental pain, pain is always mental by the way, then uh, creating a falsehood leads to bigger harm later. So there are stories about what to do in such a situation, how to correct the robot. So a robot psychologist is called who counsels the robot, Ki, are you causing harm or not? He said, no, I am not causing any harm. If there is anything which causes discomfort, I don't tell it. In fact, I tell the opposite. So what did the robo psychologist, who was a human being, <laughs> human actually lady, so she tells that robot that this is going to cause a major harm later. So you should tell. After that the robot recognizes it, corrects himself. So when you talk of consciousness, it is the understanding of the situation. If something very bad has happened and the person is in a delicate situation, you don't want to tell, you want to prepare slowly, right? So you don't, so there are very, there are a lot of nuances in all this, which we actually face in real life. So if you want robots, so these are very simple laws, three laws. Our, we, we deal with much greater uh, nuances, sophistication, and here, with just these three simple laws, there is, there is a problem. Also a story where you say, a very costly robot is built. So you say, robot, this costly robot should protect itself more than other robots. Right? So this robot costs a million dollars, the other costs 10,000 dollars <laughs> or rupees. And this million dollar robot, should not jump into fire. Let 10,000 rupee road jump into fire. Okay. So you reduce the threshold of law 3, L3, of protecting itself. So if a person obeys, you know, go there, do this, 
the 10,000 rupee robot go, million rupee robot will think about it and by, by the time the 10,000 robot would have gone. So, this is the way to, so these are all the issues that come. So, this is just to tell you that this is a nuanced thing, there is lot of thought required and I have not even raised the real issues that come with human beings you know question of autonomy, question of independence, question of responsibility, none of those we have talked about. But that is all right, right now this is enough for us to start thinking. So now the question I want to ask is, do human beings also follow any laws? Okay. So do these laws apply, yes or no? If they do not apply, do human beings? follow some other laws, what do you think? Do human beings have also follow laws or? Yeah. Do you think, do you think L3 and L1? First point is a robot will not harm human being, nor allow harm to come to his, uh, second point, a robot will obey human being. In the same way, we, we obey hierarchy, right? So, so how are we? So, which, has, which is the higher priority, L1 or L3? Sorry, yeah. Okay. Okay, so if we want to say how are these laws realized? Very good answer. Both of you have given good answers. So if you ask how are these laws in robo robots realized? Is it through some programming? And 1942, there was no computer program, right? There was no computer, no digital computer at least. Okay. So, Asimov said, these are positronic brains, not electronic brains, positronic brains. And if the robot knowingly violates, the brain will explode, he will be finished, dead. <laughs> okay, he just said that. For human beings, if you ask, how is this realized? Suppose we say, no, we also follow, but that itself is in question. So we have emotions. Yeah? Robots don't have emotions. We have feelings. Robots don't have feelings. There is a separate talk we, need, we would need to discuss whether a machine can ever have feelings. Okay. So that's a. Okay. So if you look at this, then. For human beings, you will say, no, invert L1 and L3, priority. So this is wrong for human beings. L1 is not more than L3. Yeah. It depends on the other human being involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yes. So this priority may change depending on who the other person is, whom you are trying to protect, no harm should come. So who is this other person, right? Okay. So normally you would say no, it is reverse. So would the human being save himself or herself first, always? So it say no, it depends on the, and, and when we say mother and child relationship that is the highest form of relationship. So if the child is in danger, then, then mother will rush, save the child even though her own life may be endangered. Okay? So it may be child or someone we love. Right? So this is an observation. So we will follow the method of science. What is the method of science? Observe, make theory, 
re-observe if the theory works, you accept it, otherwise you reject it. Correct? That same method we will follow. But we'll, so we'll return to this question. So let me talk about innate property of matter. So we want to know innate property of consciousness and we'll first look at simpler things, innate property of matter. So I have a question to ask you. you are, most of you are you know, students of science. What did Newton theorize that was counterintuitive? It went against intuition. People say, no, apple fell down. Everybody knows apples fall down. You know, he didn't ask the question, how did apple climb the tree? <laughs> what was counterintuitive? Laws of motion, simple. Can you guess? So what is the third law? That is uh, not counterintuitive. What about inertia? Yes. So rest is not a counterintuitive. Body lying at rest remains to lie, lie at rest. So what he said was the other side of the moving objects move forever. Okay. And this is part of you know maintaining the inertia of motion or if you want to write conservation of momentum etc in more detail. But the point is this theory opposes every single experience of every single human being in their entire life over the ages, over centuries. It goes against that. So if you had a data science, what will the machine infer? 100% of the data says on earth that moving objects stop. Yeah? You move something, it stops. You throw something, it stops. You walk, you will stop. After some time, you will get tired. Throw a ball, it will stop. Okay? So, data science is not enough. Without theory, data science is useless. It will give you wrong results. Okay? So, you augment data science with theory. Very, very important. Something that we are forgetting today to do. I'm saying this as a side because some of you. So it was counter. So Newton was obviously asked, you know, what you are saying is nonsense. It goes against what we observe all the time. So he explained it. So he said, How do you explain all our observations throughout our life? So he said, well, moving objects stop because there is an external force, right? most typically friction. But the law is innate nature of matter is to maintain the inertia of motion or rest, whichever way you want to call it. All right? So this is what we got about matter. We'll ask a similar question about consciousness. And the question I'm asking is, what do human beings want? To do good to others or to cause harm to others? It's L1, L3. It's L1 itself, a doubt. And the relationship between L1 and L3. Protect oneself versus, that is even the higher. Right? So this itself is just related to law L1. And people will say, this is what I observe all the time. Human beings, some human beings want to cause harm. Let me discuss this itself first. And depending on, depending on which assumption you took in the case of Newton, you will build two different methods of solving a problem. So suppose you build a machine with an engine and somebody says no engine is not doesn't have enough power 
So what will you do? He said, no, no, body wants to move. If it is not moving, maybe there is greater friction. You will use lubricant. Same engine now works. If you assume that no, objects want to stop, I want to push them, and larger the object, larger the machine, then you will work in that fashion. On the other hand, if you realize it is a friction which is the cause, which is the major problem, then you will work on how to reduce the friction. Okay. Similarly, for human civilization, if you assume that human beings want to do good for others, you will build one kind of civilization. If you assume human beings want to cause harm to others, you will build a different civilization, right? But only one of them will hold in real life, the other collapse. Why? Because you are violating the laws of human consciousness, okay? You can't have both the things, just like in the case of matter. In the case of consciousness also, you have to understand the innate nature of consciousness, okay? So here, if you want to ask this question, does a hungry person feel happier in giving up his bread for others? And this question I had already asked in some ways. So when he, she gives it to a child or gives it to a person related to him or her, he or she. Okay? So now in this case, you have to, so this actually happens, but it doesn't happen all the time. So most people said, well, there are no laws. You can't have any laws for human beings. No. This guy is unpredictable. He doesn't follow any laws. Okay? Right? What do you think? So if it is unpredictable, you better keep this guy in control. So now the civilization you will build will be trying to control through hierarchy. Hierarchy may be for coordination, but it can also be for control. Okay. Because this guy will harm when he or she gets a chance, right? That's the nature. Or you say, no, it's random. Sometimes there, sometimes not there. Okay. So this is a serious question. That's all I'm trying to pose. Based on this, if you work so we need to understand the human being. We need to understand the human consciousness. Okay. So if you look at now, so I'll, I'm proposing this. And this is something you can observe in yourself. What is the difference between matter and consciousness? In the case of matter, observations are external. In the case of consciousness, the observations are internal. You have to know. I can observe you, figure out that's how you must be feeling, but direct observation is internal. So, you apply a similar analogy, then human, one is way is to observe how you feel when you do something. So, how do you feel when you help somebody? Do you feel happy or do you feel bad? You feel happy. This is universal. But exceptions are there. How do you explain them? How did Newton explain the exceptions <laughs> that all bodies stop? <laughs> there is friction. So in human consciousness, the law is that they want to, we want to do good to others, except when there is fear or temptation. If I fear, you will attack me, I will go and do harm to you, okay? But you observe yourself how you feel when you do that. Say, I had to do it. 
couldn't avoid it. Otherwise, he would have done that. Okay? The reason you are putting but or if is because you are going against the normal tendency. That normal, you are going against the law of consciousness which says that you must do good to others. Okay? So these are the two and only two, there is nothing else. Fear or temptation. Okay? Now, if you look at human history, there has been a major transition. So fear and temptation don't occur separately. Normally they occur together. And there may be more fear, less temptation. There may be less fear, more temptation. Society has slowly shifted from fear to temptation. But along with temptation comes also some other kind of fear. So they go together. The other part is, because we are talking of consciousness, there is also evolution. Evolution of consciousness. And this evolution is about recognizing relationships. And these relationships go from self to family, to larger family, joint family, to village, to nation, to the world, all human beings. So this evolution, so that we know about the physical evolution, you know, Darwin, so he told us how the bodies have evolved, right? And human being is unique because it has an evolved brain. Now that we have reached there, there is another evolution going on, that is mental evolution. Okay? In fact, when you have controlled the environment around you, physical environment, about temperature, this, that, your physical evolution actually stops. But the mental evolution continues. So we have reached a stage where we are actually in for a transition in mental evolution. So over the centuries, we have evolved mentally also. Human beings have evolved mentally. But there may also, and sometimes this gets transmitted to animals also. You know, the pets behave differently from wild animals. The fear and temptation is all over, right? They are secure, no fear. They are assured of food, no temptation after that. Temptation is not a property of animals, it's a property of human beings. You want more. They say, no, I'm no more hungry, I'm fine, right? So the animal won't eat once stomach is full, okay? So animals operate largely through fear. But as the animals live with us, they start get a little bit perhaps of temptation. I'm so this mental evolution of human being is taking place. The only problem is, I do not know whether this evolution will take place fast enough or we'll kill ourselves. We'll destroy the earth. And now it seems even before we can destroy the earth, we'll kill. Wars violence environment okay but what is our innate this is our innate when do we violate it when we are afraid okay or somebody tempts us so i want to know so this is our our nature, innate nature. Now, if you want to build a society, then how do you operate? So we made a blunder in building civilization. What is the blunder? We assumed human beings are selfish and they are greedy. Okay? This is a bad guy. Every one of us is bad. But society should be good. So what should you do? Hierarchy, controls. So controls were tried. You know, 
kings and uh, despots, they turned out to be worse. Human being would have caused harm to one other person. Now the king and the army, they will cause harm to millions of people. So the method, so they said, no, we will control human beings through fear, right? through dand, punishment. And that, at some point, people realize, no, this is not good. We should move over to not fear, but temptation. And then you say, oh, if you do this, you will get higher salary. Or if you do this, you will get such and such goodies. Instead of fear, we shifted to temptation. Assuming that the human being is a bad guy, doesn't want to do good to others, he's selfish, he's greedy. But what? We focused on the friction and not on the law. External force. So if there is an external force which creates fear, which I think I'm insecure, then I'll behave in a certain way. In fact, yes, I will be selfish. Only limited things are available. Limited food, I better collect this food. So I become greedy. Because today I have, but tomorrow I won't have. Now, if we build a society based on this, then what will this society have? It will have all these problems that we are facing today. And the method was used actually for societal benefit. Human being is selfish, doesn't want to work, is greedy. So to harness these bad properties, you create market and competition. Market for efficiency, competition is based on fear. I won't have, I will be left behind. Right? It may not be about physical death, but it may be about not able to do things, not able to advance, whatever. And this aspect has been globalized. Okay? So if you start from an assumption, you say this is the axiom, and then slowly build, in a matter of 300 years, we have built, we have done it, just 300 years. Right, with the, after the industrial revolution, okay, that's it. And we have reached a dead end. Now the interesting part is, let's look at the losers and the winners. So you created this, those who are losers feel bad. This other guy has so much money, I have no money. This other guy has so much power, I, have, I don't have power. Right? Power and money, these two things. What about the guy who has the money? He is doing things against his innate nature of consciousness. He must cheat. So you say certain things are not cheating. Right? Legally, certain things will be said, no, this is okay. You can charge whatever money you want. It is not cheating. It is just demand supply. Okay? But when you think about it, say, I am not doing the right thing. I am taking advantage of his weakness, his dependence on me. So they say, but this is legal. So what happens? You are operating against your innate nature. So what will you become? You will become deeply unhappy. Your sodium brain <laughs> will lead you to deep unhappiness. And in this way, you also go against relationships. Lack of human relationships, individualism, consumerism. So these are the people who are successful. People who are unsuccessful are unhappy. People who are successful are deeply unhappy. Ultimately leading to purposelessness, depression and suicide. 
So when we are all assured of physical facilities, like never before, we are also highest rates of depression. Where more society which has more abundance is higher, even higher rate of depression. <coughs> Why is that? Because you built a very efficient system which is anti-human nature, against human consciousness. So, human being is doomed to be unhappy in this system, whether you lose or you win, right? Whether you, it's a rat race, whether you win or you lose, you remain a rat. And what I've added is, you remain an unhappy rat. If you are a happy rat, all right, at least you would be happy. You are a rat and an unhappy rat. My final line, the task of educational institutions and teachers is to nurture our students with a larger holistic vision about the human being, about the family, about society. So I'll stop here. I thought, I spoke longer. I thought we'll take more questions. Yes, yes. Beg your pardon? Yeah. <sighs> Person is moving the water and can be forced to Like if the robot knows that if the person is supposed to learn through that way and if it benefits him in the future, the context, the context of the, like, the temporary. No, he's an expert swimmer, not his learning. If he's learning, then I, I would say he's an expert swimmer. Then there is no need of. Why? He may drown. Expert swimmers don't drown. Then why would it prefer itself to go? Like if the knowledge of the existence of 10,000 robots is given to the one million dollar robot, then according to this... None of the three laws, none of the three laws talk about that. Because the laws of 10,000 dollars... Give, like, so, which law is affected? No, both are trying to do good only. Both are trying to do good only. Yeah. Huh? They are both they are both trying to save somebody and there is fire now. Yeah. So, which law is telling it that no other lo uh, other robot let other robot do it? I will not do it. L which 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 L one L two or L three? Which law? According to L one. Huh? No loss of a million dollar robot. No, L1. No, 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 I'm just saying. No, 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 you can't. So, yeah, tell me. Robot will not harm a human being or allow harm to come. Where is this issue of money? Because that is what we are trying to optimize here, right? Who is optimizing? These three laws. Not There's a fourth law. If you want to add a fourth law, that's different. No, sir, this, this situation and the question here arise because we want to save the million dollar robot from going into the fire. Yeah, so the company wanted to save, so they reduced the potential of this positronic brain for L3. <laughs> it's a very famous story that he has written, uh, Asimo, it's called Run Around. This is spacecraft has landed on a planet and they carry this million dollar robot. This is the only robot. And something goes wrong in the engine of the spacecraft after they have landed and they have to get selenium some <laughs> rare <laughs> earth uh, in that planet so you ask that robot to go and get selenium and they have they can't l last on this planet for more than few hours eight hours 
and it takes an hour to go there, hour to come back with the selenium. What they observe, the robot is not coming back. Yet this drone, they send the drone, and they observe this robot is going round and round around selenium, that source of uh, what was needed for the repair of the ro rocket spacecraft. It's going around and round. So they say, what's happening? They can't figure out. They send message, doesn't matter. And then they realize that this is a very costly robot. The company must have reduced its L3. Okay? So L2 and L3, the oh, command was go and get selenium. L3 was protect yourself. Okay? So at, at the point distance from selenium, at a fixed distance, the danger to the robot's machinery was quite great, right? So it remains at constant. The two potentials meet, and therefore that's why it goes in circles. Okay. So now what to do? And the battery is failing. They can't communicate with robot. So the story says has interesting ending. I will tell you, there are two human beings. So they say, L1 is not touched. The robot doesn't realize that we will die. Now what to do? The battery has gone. Now I can't even communicate. So one of them, with the all the you know protective gear in this planet, goes to the robot. And when the robot sees that the human being is coming, and in this very adverse uh, environment, he will die. So he comes to save the human being. That time he says, I will die if you don't get me selenium. Robot goes, gets the selenium, and they come back to it. <laughs> so you do not know in what ways all these three things will interact. OK? So what if there is no 10,000 rupee robot? <laughs> this million rupee robot was trying to save itself. Yeah. This one? Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, here, yeah, next one. You test it on yourself. So, do you feel happy when you do good to others? Yes. So, similar to what the Newton's case was there. I observe this thing, but everything stops. Isn't it like the same thing that everything stops? Stops. Uh, whatever, uh, whatever is in motion will eventually stop. Is the observation and so the observation here is external observation. Observation is that human beings sometimes do good, sometimes do bad. This is the observation, and some <coughs> depending on who you talk to. Some people will say, no, no, basically human beings do bad things to others. Yes, so because not everyone will do it, so they say, well, that's why a human being is random. So you do a screening when they are born or after 10 years, whatever, you do a screening. All those people who want to do bad things to others, go and kill them. Uh, you don't know what human being is capable of doing. Yeah, but uh, I think when children are born, I don't think they have to do that. Yes. So that is where, so that's where this is realized. Children. Children. Children are extremely cruel. Yeah, they have no 
quite a while to develop empathy. Oh no, but they will not. So they don't think it is bad. So they will not even harm the It's a good intent. Try and, I mean, look at a child when they're playing, right? I mean, because we took the talk into their head this month, he's bad, this animal is bad, this one is bad, that is bad. Otherwise, they will, um, uh, even a snake, even uh, whatever it may be, they will play with it with the normal. We don't put fear. What about oh, fear, fear and temptation? They will protect themselves. If a the hand goes in fire, they will remove. <laughs> yeah, because it hurts. But given a open chance, when they know, is there to choose between hurting somebody and not hurting somebody? That much, re that much consciousness or that much development, or that much understanding is needed, right? A child may hold a gun, playing with it, without knowing it will kill you, and then you may pull the trigger also playfulness, and may not realize what it may do. But if it realizes, if it's a situation where the child understands, out of the two, they will choose goodness. This is my claim. This is what you are saying. If they are, if they know the two, dif discriminate between the two, that much understanding is needed, right? You are saying that in that period there is no consciousness for the child? No, no, understanding. Consciousness is there, but consciousness has two properties. Isn't the innate law, right? Innate law is yeah. when they do good to others. So what is good to others? They should realize that it is good for others. I didn't, if, uh, when we say consciousness, Doing good to others means I should recognize that it is good. If I can't even recognize it, then I'm like a inert matter. Recognizing is the concept. No, no, no. That is not the sole part. Yeah. Recognizing that this will harm, this will not harm. Yeah. Then out of the two, so first that recognition is needed. If I can't even recognize that pulling the trigger causes death, I'm neither doing good nor doing bad. This is the state today. With so much technology, we are not able to distinguish between the two. But if I am able to distinguish, then the second question is, so I directly pose the second question. Assuming that you can differentiate between good and bad. If you can't even differentiate, so the entire legal system is built that way, by the way. So if I can differentiate between the two, then which one will I choose? So this, th this axiom or this law says, then I will choose goodness, doing good to others over doing bad to others. The only catch is fear or temptation. I know it will do good, bad to you, but I am afraid of you. Now I may do bad things to you. Okay? That is the difference between inert matter and consciousness. Okay. Oh. No. Doesn't happen in the non-linked matter. It will be living in a simulated universe because so only certain matrix. So how does consciousness arise? You know that question you have asked. So no, no. Given that there is consciousness, this is the property. But how does consciousness arise in the first place? Right? So that we'll have to have a separate discussion on it. Okay? And Turing test is incomplete. In fact, is wrong. Okay? Yeah. Uh, is this law complete? Yes. Yeah, you try to find its incompleteness. Evolution. Evolution. No, no. Along with this, there is evolution. What is the evolution about? Evolution is about relationship. This law is there, but if you if there is this conflict between this and that, right? Friction and 
the innate nature. So, in this is the innate nature, but externally it may generate some external situation may generate fear inside me. Fear is also inside me, doing good to others is also inside me. Okay? Temptation is also inside me. You are talking of consciousness now. So, all the, this as well as this is inside me, inside in the consciousness. Okay? And this is where you are taking a decision. Now, as you evolve, your boundary, your whom you consider your, uh, yourself, uh, the other person to be related to you, that expansion takes place. This is what I am calling is evolution. But you can drop evolution for the time being. This is a law and the fact that we are evolving. Okay? On, on the physical matter, there is no such thing, at least not known. Okay? Physical matter is physical matter. And consciousness, it is evolving. Evolving in whom I consider as my relationship, whom I consider my child, whom I consider my family. So I don't consider, you know, what's happening in Gaza and Israel as my family, so I don't care. But if I realize, no, they are also human beings, then they are my family. So this expansion of the family is what is our evolution. Yeah. Leading up to that, Kai Tachimo himself has written the story that he says that hey, the three laws of robotics are fine, but you don't define what a human being is. He talked of robotics only. He didn't Thou compare art with mindful of which one? Thou art mindful of I have not read that story. So that actually two thoughts come to a conclusion that the most perfect human being, according to the laws encoded in them, are each other. Yeah, yeah. And so they decide that they have to work to the betterment of themselves. Yeah. not to the flesh and blood humans and things like that. So, I mean, once you have no clarity on what a human being is, it's exactly what you're pointing out now. Right? Exactly, exactly. So that can, you know, quickly go down a slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so no, Asimov was against that book. Different author. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Different philosophy. In fact, he had a major problem with the Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that AI system there actually killed human beings in a deliberate manner. So he said, no, they have violated my laws. They are bad. Someone else wrote that story. So he was very unhappy with that story. Yeah. Yeah. But coming back to... The definition of a human being. Definition of a consciousness. Right? So human being is body plus consciousness. <laughs> So, robots were designed only for, so these three laws are written only for human beings. Once you say, what about other robots? What is a human being? Who defines what a human being is? That's the question. Uh, yeah. Human being is an exactly what mean. But what to me, talking about here is evolution to, of me, the of to me, it is not the human being that is important. It is consciousness that is important. So, what happens if aliens come here? Martians come here, then what? So then otherwise we'll go beyond that. Can be created So this is a big debate. But 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 big debate is can consciousness arise out of matter? Can robots feel pain? Right? And there's agreement robots can't feel pain. Then the second question. Can robots be conscious? Or consciousness is separate from ro robots, robot brain. That is the debate. You are conscious. You are conscious. But how do you know that consciousness has come from matter? No, no. What should be? It could be the other way around. If, if you prove, so it's like building the. There is something in in me, the in the machine that is from this. So the problem is the following, you know, when uh, engine was created, then people scientists started working on building perpetual motion machines, and the whole everywhere people are working on perpetual motion machine. Finally, they found it can never be built. Okay? Law of thermodynamics came in. 
So the question we have now shifted to, can consciousness arise out of matter? And this is not a solved problem. If you say yes, it can arise, then you go and build robots. Finally, consciousness will, ar will arise, pain will also come. The other view is no, consciousness cannot arise out of matter. Okay? No, but first of all, you have to define consciousness. How do you define Feelings? So, we talk of uh, two things when we talk of consciousness. One, pain. Pain is a way of saying feelings. Feelings can be happy, unhappy. So, feelings, right? But stark way to put it is pain. Can a robot feel, ever feel pain? The answer is no. Second, we can know. Uh -huh. So, that's why we'll need a... How much time do you have? I have a... Today, not today, today I have to catch a flight. But, but... Beg your pardon? No, no. If we can prove that it can never happen. Okay? We'll have to prove that. Second part is, can there be understanding? So, feelings and understanding, these two properties. And neither of the two properties can be produced in a machine. Okay? So, anyway, for this we'll need to have... Uh, understanding cannot be produced. Mm. I think... We will get into, you can go to Turing test. You know about the Chinese room experiment? No. Okay. Just read that. It raises a fundamental question that machine cannot understand. Meaning cannot be captured. Yeah. Meaning, you are giving different words to it, but machine cannot understand. Just read John Searle, Chinese room experiment. Okay. Very interesting. He has posed a dilemma. And when that paper was published, it was published in a philosophical. So philosophers, so the problem that has happened to in today's world, just like it must have happened there, people were building perpetual motion machine. They were very confident. We will build perpetual motion machine. They were not listening. That is not possible. Right? So today, we are talking of brain research, this, that, and say we can build easier. We can build people with feelings and consciousness. We, consci we can have consciousness. So, feelings and understanding. Question is, neither of the two you can get. But how do you know that? Because so, we'll have to, uh, we'll need uh, not too much time, one or two hours no, is I'm all that we need. You know, mechanical machines, but if you really, biology, the data that's fine. Biology, the by the way, anyway, is also a machine. Brain is also a machine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our end goal of uh, any human effort is to punish creation. I mean, we want to get a benefit out to the society, right? We want to be happy. Okay. <laughs> and everybody to be happy. That's the final goal. Yes. Yeah. But see, if the human effort are. Uh, in the premise of uh, saying that uh, this civilization is against human yeah. human beings is uh, primarily selfish and human. but if we build systems based on these actions uh, but I think it is too simplistic of us to uh, think that uh, they will give us right results right yes because yeah. see I think uh, comparing uh, a robot which is uh, man's creation to the, uh, I mean, uh, high complex human being, it's like comparing both uh, apples and oranges. So, um, I mean, you can't create, a, I mean, I would say um, in robots, we can't create consciousness. Robots are just man-made creation. Whatever we hard code them, they will develop. Um, I mean, trying to answer the question of consciousness, if, if, we, if we were not, um, I mean, if we should not, so, we can only answer only. Uh, so today I am addressing a different question, yes. right? We we'll have a separate talk on what is consciousness, okay? But given that whatever is our intuitive understanding of consciousness, if we 
go with that with that the society we have built is against the innate nature of human consciousness and because we have done that we are condemned to be unhappy the people who do well or people who do badly they are condemned to be unhappy my point is that Have a, I mean, spectrum of characters, right? They are selfish. They are. They are not. That is what I am saying. There is no spectrum. So no, hold it, hold it right here. I am saying every single human being is this, with no exception. Okay. However, in behavior, so what? That is what Newton said. Every single body. which is moving will move forever no exception but like but body is stop because of friction so similarly every single human being wants to do good but because of this he ends up doing bad but then yes that's right there is no darkness correct there is no evil there is only goodness Yes. Yes. Yeah, we have to. We have no choice. Other way, yeah, it is possible. If axiom is this, there is no other way. Not only it is possible, it is inevitable. Yes. See, why do perpetual machines didn't come because there was all this friction, right? No, no, no. Could that be the argument? No, that because the energy was conserved. So perpetual motion machine means energy will get created. Okay. No, that that those are the terms. So okay. the energy is leaking. No, friction right. means energy was leaking. Right. 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 Energy is leaking, and energy needs to be conserved. Somebody might say, "Let energy leak. I'll create more energy." The point I want to say is, mental energy should say, ultimately, I have to reduce fear and temptation. Because that reduces friction, and that will make for a better. Yeah. That's another way of saying. Yeah. But the holy grail will never be reached because we are condemned to always have fear and temptation. Would that be the? So what you are saying? If they want to do good to others, so if so, this is a test. So we can try to build a society in which there is no fear, there is no temptation. We try. We, we try. try. Right now we are not even trying. We are saying. human being has fear has temptation use it to build a good society okay suppose we say we will now work not on efficiency like you know we are all in iit is working on efficiency optimization that's these are the only words we use but which direction are we heading so if we say we will remove this reduce it we will try to build a society where this goes down and down after that few very small percentage of people will be left with fear you might say no no it will not be completely all right but what will happen instead of uh, jail in every city you say only one jail is needed there are only 50 people left who are still have fear <laughs> isn't that an advancement <laughs> people do say that some people are you know by their very genetic code or nature tend to behave in a certain way and some people even with a good nature depending on the environment so if you follow just the normal nature nurture debate so what i am saying is this is the nature nurture is very bad and society is even worse so in that society with wrong axioms you now try to have nurture so that anti against the innateness that goes in okay now actually you are you know epigenetics just read about epigenetics epigenetics says for biology i'm not talking of society now even for biology certain genes express themselves you have you know an organism which is uh, let's say 
it is going to you know in biology it will, it will generate let's say some disease in your body but if the right environment is provided then that gene will not express itself they will not say gene has gone away gene is there but it will not express itself so those 50 people who are left who still have fear they will not express them in a bad way so epigenetics says that nature nurture debate is more complex than just nature and nurture if nurture and the environment is right even though the genetic genes are saying do this those genes will not express themselves okay just read on epigenetics i don't i in my whole talk i have not used the word good or bad except once right when i use this here good to others so it is not my idea to judge this is good or this is bad what is my the question uh, that i would pose i'm sorry what did you say is individualism bad is individualism bad is individual will individualism lead to your happiness or not that is what i will say if it leads to happiness it is good for you if not it is bad for you okay स्ट्रक्चर So we as the Indians, we are a, a people who thrive on um, 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 sizable, um, small units of uh, family together. So we give value to our family members. But so West is any different? But they are they are mostly very no no. no. They have now they are living in a society which has become individualistic. Yes. They don't know what is yes. the alternative. So I would say so. No, human beings are not different. Yes. Race wise, yes. color wise, caste wise, they are all same. Yes, sir. I would say best to reach their point. Uh, they they could not actually um, what say um, they could not. Uh, I mean, they could not uh, help themselves to understand the 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 dark side of human nature. So even the systems did not help them. So they reached a point of individualism now. But I think we are not yet there. Right? I would. Say. The alternative explanation is they fail to see the good side of human being. They assume this is the dark side, built society on that, and after building it. you find highest rate of depression so it is not innate nature we don't want to be individual we want to be related this is part of me this is part of you this part of every single human being on earth so uh, what is the advice to you this is the last question i want to ask this is the last question. what is the advice to you to a young generation like that how do we actually build ourselves given that I am actually focusing on improving myself without actually thinking in this form that I actually try to do good towards this by reducing friction. I'm not thinking in this way. I'm, I'm only thinking in this way that I want to improve myself. I want to become better at, at doing research and such. So how do I train myself? How do I force uh, shift my thinking? Here? So the problem is in in what you just said. I am trying to do better research. Now that is not full life. Okay, I've done research all my life, okay. but it is incomplete. You have to deal with people. You have to deal with your family, right? And enjoy, not just deal in the negative sense, very positive sense. So, as understanding, cognitive analysis, analytical brain, the feeling brain, feeling parts are downplayed. Feelings are downplayed. So you are an incomplete human being if you are only focusing on research. you cannot your feelings are a important part because it is the feelings that generate what you want to do
Okay, so that is why I have put that last line about education, on which I can speak for hundred hours, or if not more. That is, this is where we are failing. Okay, we as teachers are failing. Holistic vision. We are saying you do good in your studies, good and be good analytically, be creative, but for certain things only. Then we are. reduced ourselves to a narrow human being but that is not natural to us so we will be unhappy okay. if we do only one part other part we leave okay so what you are given no no we can close it we but can we, can, we can we can have ha uh, we will have coffee and we'll d- discuss over coffee yeah i if i didn't have a flight i would have said We are here. I am too conscious about that. No, I have time. I have time. Coffee, juice, coffee. I'll give a one-line answer. Uh, because it is educational in the society. It is a primary duty of educational institution to create a holistic human being. others should also do it not that others should not do it even when you are you know uh, you are on the street or you are in a family that is any way part of it but as a organized thing this is a primary duty given to educational institution from school you know school onwards so that is why and i believe the failure has come there thank you <laughs> so we have coffee snack outside so i've written this book on what iit should do oh, okay that was it just last month oh Are you planning to go to Sri Lanka?